Thank you. Hello. So, uh, yeah, my name is Victor Magnusson. I'm just going to run through a little bit first presentation of myself so you know who I am and why I'm talking. Um, let's see if this works. Nope. 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 You both. You do like, wow. Isn't it just the keys? No. Hello. Maybe I have to go over here. Oh, hey, so I am a game designer. Uh, I'm currently also working as a producer, and I'm also the team manager of our design team at FatShark. Uh, a little bit of my background. Uh, I'm born in Stockholm. Uh, I also started studying finance, um, and I also thought it was very soul crushing and wanted to kill myself. So um, after doing that for like three years, I had an internship at a uh, stockbroking firm in Stockholm and I thought, okay, I'm going to kill myself if I get my boss's job, so it might be a good idea to change profession. Uh, my oldest friend uh, uh, was going here to uh, this uh, school here, studying game design. I had no idea you could even study game design at that time. Uh, so I decided to, what the fuck, uh, let's go. And I moved to VSP and started here for three years, uh, game design and art, it was back then. And after that, I moved back to Stockholm. I uh, did like an internship at a place called Green Ad People. They do uh, like events with an alternative reality gaming twist sort of on mobile phones. So I wrote some games for them. Uh, it was mostly like, um, like, Orgs, but for companies. So I did something like for Skanska when they were going to have a big conference. I wrote like a game for them to have a really interactive and fun conference, uh, stuff like that. And after uh, like almost a year, six months working there, I started at Fat Shark. Uh, they didn't have a QA team. We were like 20 when I started there. Uh, so I started out as a QA, and then I became a game designer, and now and then a team manager, and now also a producer. So, games that I worked on is the first game that we made was Lead and Gold. I was the QA on that game, uh, and I also started up like our QA department. And then my first sort of uh, game design job was as a work for hire because we back then we also did work for hire for other companies. Uh, I worked on Battlefield Play for free for what was then called Easy, which is, doesn't exist anymore, but it was like a subsidiary to. Dice that did their free to play the games. And then I came back to Fat Shark again and I was the game designer on a game called Crater or Crater. It was a really uh, strange game. Uh, it, a lot of the stuff that I learned making that game is going to go into what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we uh, had one year to do that game. We were like 10 people and we over scoped like crazy and it became a in the end, uh, it's, uh, I, you know, I'm, I was really sort of embarrassed by the game when we launched it because I, I could only see all the problems with it and all the like things that we should have done and everything like that. But now, in hindsight, when I look back at the game, I think it's, it's a really cute little game and I'm really proud of it and I'm really happy that we did it and it's, a, it's actually pretty cool for what it is. Then I worked a little bit on Escape uh, Dead Island, uh, Escape from Dead Island, I should say. Um, there was actually two iterations of that game, and I worked on the first one, which was cancelled. And then they made another one. Uh, but when they made the, the other one, I was on parental leave, so I had nothing to do with that. So the game that you, if you know about that game, that actually came out, I had, I, I did like the, the base of that game, but I have very little to do with the rest of it. Then I worked uh, on Vermintide, and now we are working on Vermintide 2. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about Fat Shark as a company. So we're also a indie <laughs> company, but we're a little bit bigger indie company. So we're about 70 people. We were funded in 2007. And like I said previously, when we started out, we worked, we did a lot of work for hire to like be able to pay for stuff and to be able to work on our own games. So we uh, <coughs> worked a lot with uh, other game studios as uh, Green in Stockholm and also another game, old studio called Amuse that did a game called uh, Redemption, what's it called? Uh, something. Ah, it was before my time. Um, 
and now we're working on Vermintide and our focus as a company uh, for the last couple of years has been multiplayer games and especially now cooperative multiplayer games. And <clears throat> we decided to have this sort of focused approach to what we do and really narrow down what we were doing because before that, as you could see, like the games that we've done previously, Let Go was a multiplayer game, uh, Krator is a single player role playing game and then we did uh, Oh yeah, I have a list of all of our games here. So like Let and Gold, sing no, Let and Gold multiplayer game with um, in, uh, Cowboys, and then Beyond the Commander Rearmed, a side-scroller, and then we did Hamilton's Great Adventure, which was like a puzzle game for children, it was supposed to be, but we released it on Steam, and there's no children on Steam, so it was a pretty bad idea, but it's, we've been working on that game probably the most time of all the games that we've done, which is a strange thing. But, and then we did Crowther, which was like a single-player role-playing game, and then we did War of the Roses and War of the Vikings, which were multiplayer uh, versus games, in one in, um, in the medieval setting and one in Vikings, and then Escape from the Nylon. So the result of all of those games was like, okay, we need to focus on what we're doing, we're doing too many different things all the time, and uh, we're not getting, I mean, we're learning a lot of stuff, but we're not really getting better at what we're doing, we're not honing our craft. So we decided to, okay, what are we best at? Okay, we are best at doing multiplayer games, and we are best at doing, uh, and all of our games always had this sort of cooperative aspect, so let's focus on that. And then that decision we took before doing Vermintide, and uh, now we've been working on Vermintide for like two years and we're soon going to release Vermintide 2. And Vermintide is by far the biggest success that we've had. And a lot of the reason why it became so much better and so much more successful is because we really focused on what we were, we were going to do and didn't overscope and didn't think like, oh, let's do everything and do this and this and this and change things all around all the time instead of really, really focusing on, okay, what are we doing? We are doing a cooperative game, and we're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna take a lot of inspiration on Left 4 Dead because we think that Left 4 Dead is one of the absolute best cooperative games that's ever done. And we're gonna add Warhammer to it, and we're gonna add melee combat because we are really good at doing melee combat, which we had done in World of Roses and World of Vikings. So we're gonna take a couple of our strengths and we're gonna add it to this concept, which we really like. And we're not gonna do anything more. We're not gonna add multiplayer versus. We're not gonna do all these crazy things that you think you like when you want to come up with a game idea. We're just going to do it and we're going to do it really, really good. And the sort of result speaks for itself. A um, little bit just other stuff we've done Terminate Salvations and Battle Be Fair Free. That's what we're talking about. I'm going to start out with just a trailer of uh, Vermintide 2, just in case you have never heard of the game so you know what I'm talking about. Let's see if this works. Oh. Ah. So, the Northlanders like to play with fire. So do I. Not the first town I've seen in this state. Don't get easier. Don't ever get easier. There's, there comes a, some gameplay after this, but I'm going to stop it here. Uh, so, let, how do I get back to... Do, do, do. Oh, so, yes. So, I'm going to talk about the box, or like, it's right, the thing I came up with. <laughs> um, so, what I'm going to talk about basically is pretty interesting. It, it, it's kind of funny because the speaker before me uh, was talking about how they just went crazy and like did so much and they had really passionate and I think it's awesome that they're doing it and they were working for like seven years. I'm going to talk about how you don't work for seven years. <laughs> so that's uh, um, the idea of my talk. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of tips and like ideas on how we thought when we designed Vermintide and uh, 
um, yeah, a different tools that we use and that you can use as well, hopefully. So what is the box? Well, the box is a framework to work within. Um, it's a set of rules that you set up in the beginning of your project, uh, in like the pre-production phase of your project. You decide what is this game going to be, uh, how are we going to do things, like uh, what are the rules, what are the, all of that kind of stuff, and you decide upon them uh, early, as early on as you can, and you stick to them as much as you can. Um, it, yeah, exactly. And it's also, in the end, this will become your game. So it's really important that you really think through what you're going to do. Like, uh, what are we making? What are the core ideas that we're going to do? Like, why are we making this game? Wh who are we targeting? Uh, and what type of gameplay we're going to have? And what type of gameplay are we not going to have? It's equally important as the stuff that you're going to do. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few, few <coughs> different methods that we did. Uh, uh, why the uh, communications is like the biggest part of this is a really important thing when you're working on a game. You're going to be working on this game for maybe at least at least a year and probably two or three years. And communication, and especially if you're in a little bit of a bigger team, but also in small teams, is so important because it's really, really easy that people are working on things separately and not understanding each other, really. Especially if you're a game designer, it's really, really important that you're using a vocabulary that people understand. So when you're writing designs and talking about what you want to do, that they actually understand what, what your intention was and don't do anything else. <clears throat> Some water. Staying on course is also really important. Like it's so so easy when you're making games that you get derailed and you start making something else. This is what happened when we were making Crater. We like set out to do this really small little game and we just went of course like every day. <laughs> it was like a new course. Oh well, we have to do this and it has to be like this and we have to have one hundred uh, whatnots and da 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 and we just we were just wearing, of course, all the time, and it's really, really dangerous, and you, you, you never like get anywhere, and it, and the end product is gonna really hurt from this. So it's really, really important to always look back and like, why are we doing this? What are we doing? What was our own in, uh, intention from the start? Uh, and this is to get a really good and cohesive end product. Like to so. It's, it will be obvious when the game is done that peop these guys didn't know what they were doing, sort of. That they, they didn't think this through. That uh, the end game is going to be all over the place. It's not going to be a really tightly made game. So I, I, I bet you that most of the really games that you think are, ah, oh, this is so good, they had a really, really good idea what were they were doing. So it's important. And at least they figured out the idea when they were making the game and the communication in the team was really good. So, uh, and also, this is, I think, really important. It's really hard to be creative when you have, when you can do anything. It sounds like, oh, it's so good, like we can do whatever we want, it's ah, uh, and then you sit down and you're gonna start writing something and you're gonna come up with something you can't think of anything. It happens to me all the time, like the blank page dilemma. So having limitations actually helps you to be creative. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's really, really true. Like if you have, like, okay, we can only have, uh, let's say, uh, two enemies. You're going to make those two enemies really, really good. If you, your idea is, oh, we can do how many we want, you just start designing stuff, and it's like, and then it doesn't really work. It's, it's really, it's, it, limitations, you should embrace limitations instead of, like, thinking of them as bad things. It's like, you can always twist them and turn them, and, like, that's where the really good stuff comes. It's not, like... Oh, I have so many ideas. Everybody has ideas. Like that's not an uncommon thing to have in the games business. Everybody has millions and millions and millions of ideas. It's it's coming to the good ideas and then and actually like using them and then not just wasting them. That is really important. So uh, these are three different things that we use or tools that we use when we're doing it. Yeah, uh, when we're doing Vermintide. First one is game pillars. Uh, the second one is Gestalt, so I'm going to go through this later on, and then there's level design definitions. These are just three of the ones that we were using, but there were, these are the three ones that I was mostly involved with, so I'm going to talk about them. So there can be, I mean, you can have, you can set up these types of 
like rules for anything, you know, coding or uh, art and everything. So, and, and I think it's a really good idea to do as well. Um, so first of all, what are game pillars? So they're the backbone of the game. This is the original idea, like the the taken the, the idea of the, the the most sort of shaven down, most simplified version of what type of game are we going to make. Um, this is there to get everybody on track. As soon as anybody is like, I don't know what we're doing. What are, what is this game about? Blah blah. blah. Like, why are we doing this game? Uh, you should just be able to point to the pillars and say, this is what we're doing. Um, and it's also something that you can. It's like a it's like a ball plank you can throw ideas against. So like you come up with this really cool idea, you look at the pillars, and it's like, oh, we're gonna have. Uh, <laughs> um, versus multiplayer in our game. Ah, uh, no, our focus is co-op, so no, we're not going to have multiplayer versus multiplayer in our game. That type of stuff. Uh, and it's really good to have as like a deciding factor to fall back on if there is a really tough question and you don't really know the answer. You can go back to your pillars again and look like, does this serve the purpose or the idea that we had from the start? So I'm going to go through the pillars that we had for Vermintide. Um, the first one, and should probably be the, one of the most important one, and one that we have gotten a really, really, really good response about, is true to the Warhammer IP. So we were going to make Vermintide as a part of the Warhammer uh, fantasy universe, and we felt, and and I think a lot of our players also feels that it was super, super important to stay true to what is Warhammer. There's, um. This might be a little bit rude, but there are a lot of Warhammer games that have sort of neglected this part. And we felt that it was time that somebody did something really, really cool in the Warhammer universe. And we felt like we were the guys to do it, because we had a lot of people at our uh, office that are hardcore Warhammer uh, enthusiasts, nerds, like uh, painters, uh, modelers, all that stuff, and they've been playing since they were like the 80s. So we really knew this brand, and we were not going to sort of fuck it up. We were going to stay as true to the Warhammer fancy IP as possible. Um, co-op, we were going to make a co-op game. So everything that went against co-op went straight out. Like if this does not promote co-op, it's the idea is stupid. Like so, uh, one example of that is we, everybody in the game gets rewarded equally. It doesn't matter what you did. Uh, it's really important. We don't want people to, like, I'm going to get the kill, so I'm going to get the thing. Uh, we, we don't have any sort of, sort of, you don't get a better score at the end of the game if you've uh, killed more enemies and stuff like that, because that does not promote co-op. That promotes uh, competition. We don't want competition between our four players. We want them to cooperate at all times. So that was a really important one. Uh, survival. We wanted to make a survival game. We wanted p players to feel a little bit scared when they're playing the game, because if you feel a little bit scared, you're going to stick together and you're going to play the game as we intended it to be. Uh, pacing. So we wanted the game to have a really nice pacing when you're playing through a level. Uh, we wanted like an ebb and flow of enemies and encounters. We wanted uh, the like calm moments and also the really high intensity moments, but we didn't want them to be all the time, all of the time. So we had to develop our AI director, which controls all the, the pacing, to be able to um, make that happen in the game because the, the game is really systematic. What happens in a level? This also goes down to level design. It goes down to uh, um, like enemy design. It goes down to uh, combat design and like weapons and stuff like that as well. Um, and then we wanted the game to have a sense of progression. This is a little bit vague, but the thing, the takeaway here is we were doing a game in a Warhammer setting, so the first thought people would have, like, it's an RPG. Uh, and it was like fantasy as well, so people that don't know about Warhammer would think, oh, cool, uh, RPG. And so we wanted RPG elements, but we were really uh, focused on making sure that we didn't sell them a game where they would think that they were going to play Skyrim, because this is not Skyrim at all. It's it's a it's an action game with RPG elements in it. So we wanted a sense of progression. Also, we felt that was something that was lacking in Left 4 Dead. 
uh, like Left 4 Dead, you could play for hours and hours and hours and hours, you got nothing out of it. So we added a loot system to the game, but we wanted it to be like a limited loot system. It's not full on RPG systems, blah, 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 blah. It's just like, it's there to give you a sense of like achievement, give you something to strive for and stuff like that and not be the main focus of the game, which it almost turned out to be anyway, but that was a, not our intention. <laughs> But if you put loot in your game, you better uh, remember that people are going to be min-maxing. They are going to be going for loot. Loot is very powerful. Respect loot. <laughs> so don't just throw that in there. Um, uh, Gestalts is uh, it's another old alumni here, Mats, who's been here a couple of times. It's one of his little babies. He's uh, another of the game designers of the game. This is something that he really loves. Uh, what it is, is a common vocabulary. So when we are talking about, and this is mainly focused on like game design when it comes to like combat, uh, the player and stuff like that, weapons. Uh, and the reason why we did this is we wanted the common vocabulary. So when we were talking about things in the game, we could talk about it with terms that everybody understood. Uh, and it's something that you can map ideas to and it's something you can like co cover all the bases of the games by talking about these uh, words that you come up with. And basically, Gestalt is just, it, it can be anything. Uh, it, it doesn't really mean anything if you don't know what we're talking about. Like, it, it doesn't, it, it, this is not something you can take from a textbook. It's something, it's a vocabulary that we made up. Like, so I'm going to go through them. So for melee combat, we had a bunch of different gestalts, and these, these gestalts were people that like these are it's it's like these are the type of players that are going to be playing the game. This is what they they are going to like. These are the types of player uh, um, uh, blah, 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 what they call uh, like uh, motivations that we're going to cater to. So we're we're going to cater to people like playing a tank. We're going to cater to players that wants to be a smiter. Um, a smiter, like tank is pretty self-explanatory. Everybody understands that. Smiter, maybe not. Okay, smiter for us uh, was uh, like people that, the dude bros, people that come into the game, they want a big ass two-handed two hammer and they just want to go smack and, and things should die. That was like, okay, we want to cater to those people. So that's a type of a player that we want to cater to. We want to cater to a ninja fencer. What is that? It's just stupid name. Ninja fencers for us is ninjas and fencers. So it's people that run around, think that they're ninjas, and they like to be very precise. Like they, they, they go for headshots, they go for crits. They are like super, super, like uh, the uh, CS player, like stuff like that, that are like super, super, super twitchy, really fast, likes moving around, likes like being super, super precise. Um, and then linesman, this is like the the good guy in the team. He, he is not really the tank, but he wants to help out. So he's standing in the front line and he's trying to kill or like at least um, occupy as many enemies uh, as possible at a time. Then we had, we did the same thing for ranged and then we had carbine. So carbine is like, think of um, um, like old uh, World War I weaponry, that type of like, ka-ching, ka-ching that type of like rifles in that way. Um, boomers, pretty self-explanatory. They'd like to see a thing go boom. Um, like, a, 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 like the boomer was sort of like the um, rocket launcher in Quake or like the, the grenade launcher in Quake, that type of gameplay. Sniper, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, machine gun, it's pretty, also pretty self-explanatory. And then we had a kiter, and then we had a trapper, sort of similar, and then we had a duelist. But then we decided that we did not want to have a kiter and a trapper and a duelist, because it didn't work with our gameplay, so we removed those. But we, in like our pre-design, we, uh, we had them in there still, and we discussed how they would work, and so we knew if we wanted to keep them or not, like sort of. So we were still thinking about how we would cater to them, but then we decided that we we're not going to use them. It's not, it didn't fit the gameplay, so we removed them. But it's, it can also be good to like talk about, so you know, 
what a kaito for us means or what a duelist means. And the duelist was like a, a really complicated street fighter type of mechanics. Like uh, you punch me, I block and I parry and I do a counter punch and stuff like that. So, and we just decided that it's too, it was too like, sort of, our game is too fast and it's, there's too much going on. There's too many enemies, it wouldn't work out. Um, so things that we implied this terminology on was weapons. So when we create a weapon, we decide like, okay, so all of our weapons has two different swings. They have a light attack and then they have a heavy attack. And we try as much as we can to apply each weapon to two different player uh, gestalts. So like our uh, two-handed hammer is a, the light attack is a smiter. It goes like this, boom. Kills almost everything, like it's really good, and feels really well, or really nice. And then the heavy attack is actually, you would think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a line spin, but it's actually a tanking uh, attack, because it only hurts one uh, enemy, and the rest just get moved out of the way. So it's actually designed to be for like people that likes to tank, not really do damage, they just want to help out. Um, we also applied it to enemies, and this was like when we were designing the enemies, we thought, okay, who is this enemy? Who's going to like playing against this enemy? Who will be really effective against this enemy? So we mapped it against all of our enemies as well and made sure that we had enemies for every type of player. And then we, to the pacing as well, so like everybody has their own time to shine. All types of players should be able to find a time in each level where they are like, okay, now it's my time to go. And we applied it to level design as well. Uh, so this is an example of, uh, this is our mace. It's a new weapon for Vermintide 2. And it's, this is a tank linesman weapon. So it, uh, um, one of the attacks is really good at like hitting a lot of people and doing some damage. The other one is really good at just pushing them around and like making sure you have time to react. This is the, the spear, so it's a ninja fencer uh, slash linesman slash ninja fencer because <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated. Like the the ninja fen the, the light attack is like a stab, and it, you want to hit people in the the face with it. So you need to be really like fast, jump around, do really like acrobatic moves, and like try to hit them in the face. The heavy attacks has a combo. So the first one is a linesman and then it becomes a ninja fencer again. And this is like something we tried to avoid is like my, my initial reaction to the spear was why is it like this? And then the heavy attack is like this. I was like, this doesn't feel counterintuitive. It should be like this and then it should be like this. But then Mats was like, no, 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 no. Then we're not only catering to one type of person. So it became, and actually now it really works really nice. Um, this is the um, <coughs> our uh, right. It's Nicholas. It's the handgun exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the war, war universe, handguns is rifles and pistols are pistols. Yeah. Uh, so this one is sort of carbine-ish, but it's a little bit more sniper. Uh, and then this is one also new weapon. It's our repeating crossbow for our elf character, and it has like a carbine. Um, the quick attack is like a carbine, it goes click, 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 and then it has a burst attack. So that's sort of a new thing that we've, we didn't have this for Romita 1. But then also, like, it fills this machine gun spot in the, in like the, just that. Um, this is the Chaos Raider, and uh, he's designed to fill like uh, a tank linesman, uh, or be a good adversary against people that like being a tank, because there's a lot of them coming. You need somebody to like take care of them, uh, make sure that they don't overwhelm you and surround you. So he's really good against that. This is a uh, rattling gunner. You need to shoot this guy from far. So he really caters to sniper carbine type of uh, gestalt. And this is the rat ogre. He caters to everyone because he's like a boss. So we want him to have. He he has like weak spots in his head, so you need you want to like ninja fence him in the face, but then also you need somebody to tank him, you need somebody to smite him, and you need somebody to ninja shotgun him in, in the face. So, uh, but this is like the way we thought about our enemies and our weapons to make sure that we sort of had mapped everything to all the types of players that we thought were going to play the game. 
Uh, now we're to level design definitions. So again, common knowledge, uh, common language. So we, when we're talking about the levels, we we know what we're saying. Um, it's a it's a way to analyze the levels. Like when you've done a level, you can go through it again and look at it and like, what have I actually made? Uh, and it's a way, or it's a tool to make sure that players are taken on a journey in the levels. Like, uh, you need different, so these definitions are going to be mostly like topographical uh, definitions. So it's really important that you change the topographical uh, um, setting in the level a bunch of times, because otherwise it just feels like one long sort of, you can't remember anything, it just like, yeah, I remember like starting and ending the level uh, in between was nothing. So <clears throat> these are the ones that we were using. So we had corridors, kind of explanatory, but it's, this doesn't actually mean corridors. It's like corridors for us, when we talk about this is a corridor, it just means that it plays like a corridor. Like you are just walking straight forward. Uh, there's no turns or stuff like that. It's, this is pretty plain. It's pretty straightforward. So it doesn't have to be an actual corridor. Um, mazes, also really self-explanatory. We wanted to have like mazes a little bit here and there, but this doesn't have to be a legit maze. Uh, plazas, so like big open spaces. Verticality, we wanted to be like, you'd be able to uh, jump up and down and small ups and downs and stuff like that. And also like really steep hills and stuff like that. Um, Drops is something that we use in our game a lot. Uh, it promotes co-op really well. Uh, like you come to a, a point where you, if you jump down, you can come back. So if you jump down first and the rest of your friends don't, you're pretty screwed. If some of the enemies come and they're going to kill you, nobody can do anything. Or if you're the last one to leave as well. So this is a really important thing to like have often in our game. Uh, and then we have events. And these are like the... Uh, end crescendo of the levels, or sometimes it's in the middle. But this is just terminology that, so when we're talking to each other, we understand what we're talking about. Um, and then side paths and exploration. So I'm going to go through one of our levels. So this is the Magnus Tower, or no, it's actually called the Horn of Magnus. The Magnus Tower is our... And so when you look at it like this, it sort of looks like it's just one big maze, but it actually it's like the, f so you start over here and this whole part here plays exactly like a corridor because there's, there's some going around, but you, when you play the game, you just run from here and then you run all the way here into this house. And in this little house, there's a little bit of a maze aspect. Then you come out into a plaza, which is pretty big. This is a, like, you get easily surrounded here. Often there's a pretty good fight going on here. And then you come to a, a maze part, and uh, people sort of get a little bit lost, and it, but it's, it's not that hard to find your way, but it's, at least it's a change of pace from what you've been doing earlier. And then you come to a really long, 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 long corridor, down to an event, and then there's a big plaza. So, like these parts, which are like side parts and stuff, for the, like the, the, the base experience of the level, especially if you're playing it through over and over and over again, they don't really matter after a while because you're just going to run the corridor. So even though there are lots of cool stuff to do here and there are side paths and stuff like that, this just plays like a corridor. So, and that's something that it's really easy to sort of forget when you're making a level. It's like, because we had a problem actually. It was like after but one year of development, we realized that all of our levels are almost the same. Like they are corridors. They are like four meters wide corridors. We have lots of stuff on the side. There's like millions of places to go. But when you're actually, actually playing the levels, you're just running in a corridor. So we then decided to like be really strict and like say, okay, you're allowed to have a corridor. Then you have to have something else. And then you have to change to a maze. Then you can put another maze and another maze. And like have that. So we, we like we took all our levels, ran through them and like analyzed, okay, what is this? Like is this a corridor, is this a maze, is this something like that? And then we redid them. So and it might sound really sort of 
uh, intuitive or like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, but I'm always, all my levels are awesome. But it is actually, it's really easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you've created this really cool maze, but actually it's just a corridor or actually, or you think that it's, oh, this is really straightforward, but it's super complicated and people get lost and they just, uh, like, they, they feel that it's, it's a maze and they don't understand what's going on. But you feel like, oh, it's just, if you, do, if you know what you're doing, you just go this way and, like, yeah. So it's really important just to, like, when you're doing level design is to remember to, like, switch up your game a lot because it becomes really, really monotonous and really boring if you don't do that because people won't remember stuff. Do they remember, like, if you play this level, you will remember, like, this and you will remember uh, this and you'll remember this. Most often, like if, if you ask somebody after they played the level, like, oh, okay, I remember the fire pit here, it was pretty cool. And then I remember the event here and I remember the big plaza. They, they will probably most likely forget about like the, the corridor here. They would just, it, it, it serves its purpose. It needs to be there because if it's only this like or that, it becomes really boring as well. And if it becomes really, it's, it's too much, like you can handle it. So it is really important as well. So like in conjunction, what I was like trying to hopefully convey to you guys is to, it is really important when you are making a game uh, that you think through it from the, like, the start when you're starting out, like what are we making? And then stay true to that idea as much as you can. And always go back to like the game pillars, like oh, d co continuously repeat them, like in every time you have a meeting or something like that. Like take them up again and look at them because it's really, really, really easy to forget about them and then you're doing stuff like so because it takes a long, long, long time to make games. And it's and, and there's a lot of people involved. It, it depends, like if you're a small indie team, you might not have this problem. But if you are as we are now, like 70 people working on a game, you think like, oh, everybody knows everything that I'm knowing, especially if like you're a designer. It's really, really easy to think that everybody else knows what's going on. Because you know everything that's going on. You, you decided most of the stuff that's going on. So you're going to like, ah, oh, yeah, everybody knows. It's a really cool co-op game. But all of a sudden, you'll notice that like, the animator or like a coder that's working on the engine or something like that, they have no idea what you're making. Because they, they don't have time to play the game all the time. They maybe after, and, and the less they feel involved and the less they feel like they know what's going on, they're going to start not caring anymore. So it's really important to like, keep people um, like understanding this is the game that we're making. So it's really important to have tools like this to talk about. And common vocabulary is super important because otherwise when you're saying a corridor for like you might mean something completely different than it means for me, especially in, a, in like a game setting uh, or like a maze or uh, like a smiter or whatever, like all these types of things that can mean completely different things. So it's really important to sit down, talk to everybody, explain, okay, these are the words we're going to be using when we're talking about our game, uh, and then make sure that everybody understands and are like on par. So now I'm going to leave for Niklas. <laughs>